of Science, Engineering and Medicine, where he's also a member of the Policy and Global Affairs Committee. Foster is also fellow at the Creative Destruction Laboratory, uh, recently renamed Endless Frontiers Lab, which both he and I and probably many other people have uh, trouble remembering. A venture incubator in, oh, sorry, this one is in Canada. I meant the stern one. In his spare time, Dr. Foster has written two best-selling books, Innovation, The Attacker's Advantage, and Creative Destruction. He received his bachelor's, master's, and PhD from Yale University in engineering, so he's ours, and applied science, and was elected as a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2008. We are so lucky to have him join us today and speak to us, and I hope that each of you takes away the knowledge from Creativity's history, and you work to make it part of how we problem solve moving forward. Dick, thank you very much for coming. Now, the most important thing I have to do is turn this on. See if I can do that. Is that on? Yeah. Great. I thought turning it on was the most important part. Getting it back in my pocket seems to be the most important part. Thank you very much. Um, and it's very nice to see you all here. I'm very proud to uh, have this invitation. Uh, you guys are the innovators in New York City. You are the ones that are making new things happen uh, all the time. So it's a real honor to be with you. I'd rather listen to you than to have you listen to me. But uh, unfortunately, we're not going to do it that way today. So um, I'm going to talk. Uh, about the history of the concept of creativity. And everybody, a lot of people say, well, what do you mean the history of the concept? I mean, this concept has always been with us. And in fact, that's not true. So we're going to see where that concept uh, came from. Uh, it's going to be uh, a brief concept. I hope it seems brief to you. Um, it's brief compared to the, the history. And it'll be a mostly Western uh, view. There's a reason that it's a mostly Western view, and that's because the concept doesn't seem to exist uh, in any well-defined form in China that I know of. Now, I've spent 20 years trying to find it, and I'm sure, and, but in that 20 years, I have not read all 5,000 years of history of China, so uh, there may be things in China that I don't know about. If you know about them, I would love to know about them. So, but the majority of the literature comes uh, from the Eastern uh, uh, us uh, in uh, the U.S. and in, in Europe. So the subject is creativity. Uh, I'm going to talk about what it is, uh, the magic of the near possible as opposed to the virtually impossible, uh, whether you can do it and whether I can uh, do it, and how to do it better. So those are, the, those are the basic topics that we're going to talk about. And when you walk out of here, I hope you'll have answers to those questions. If you don't, raise your hand, and I'll call on you, and then we'll try to get you answers to those questions. Let me first start uh, with a, what creativity is not, in my mind. This is not a picture of creativity. This is, I don't know what this is, but it's not creativity. It's, uh, it's just throwing things together. Maybe it was satisfying for this family. Uh, and it is certainly multiple things, but there's no central concept here. There's no fundamental insight uh, into this. And so I don't consider this to be a creative uh, exercise. I will tell you what I do consider to be creative uh, in, in a while. But the, the notion of doing something creative, something that hasn't been done before, goes back uh, a fair ways. Uh, the first example I know of was 77,000 BC. And despite what some people uh, say, I was not born in 77,000 BC. So uh, this, this is quite old. This is a drawing from the Blombos Cave in, in South Africa. Uh, and it's uh, etched on a piece of, of rock. They also uh, were growing uh, marijuana uh, then. And they were using it as bedding. So if, that, if you haven't thought of doing that, you might want to think about that. It's, uh, <clears throat> so these, these are uh, quite old ideas. Here's a pair of flutes uh, from, uh, uh, found in a cave in, in Germany, dated to 43,000 BC, which is the more conventional uh, date uh, for the beginning of uh, the Cro-Magnon species, which is the one that more or less evolved into all, all of us. Uh, and of course, they're cave paintings uh, from, from Spain. So if you wanted to have a, a birthday of creativity, I might put it at about 45,000 BC. 
the, my favorite example uh, of this uh, comes from uh, Holenstein Stadel uh, in Germany uh, from, from this cave. And in this cave was found the lion man of Holenstein Stadel. Um, it might be the lion woman of Holenstein Stadel. I don't think that question has been answered yet. Uh, but it's, it's uh, certainly uh, the, the case. And that's uh, now dated to about 43,000 BC. It's the head of a lion and the body of, a, of an individual. There were no such animals on the planet. <laughs> all, all, all animals with a lion head came with a lion body, and all people with a human body came with a human head. So associating, where did that idea come from? What were they trying to get at? Why would somebody try to put a lion's head on a human body? And that association of previously unassociated concepts, you'll see, is my definition of creativity. So somebody thought, hmm, there's, while it's clear that a lion is not a human, there is, there's something in that lion, maybe it was courage, uh, that it was absent in the human that they were thinking about, and they wanted to imbue the human with that. That's pure speculation. But it was something like that. They, they saw a connection between a lion and a human that, so far as we know, had not been seen uh, uh, before. So there's the head of a lion uh, and uh, uh, the, the body of, of a man. There's a question about whether this is creativity or innovation. I will claim it's creativity. Uh, I will claim that uh, creativity is having the idea. Innovation is making something out of the idea. There's a, there's a big difference between those, those two. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about the creativity uh, part. Um, then then uh, not much happened for the next 42,000 years or 40,000 years uh, until we had uh, the birth of utilitarian uh, innovation, and it was all over the place. So the wheel, which came from a cross-section of a tree, uh, that uh, was as far as any, anybody uh, knows. Uh, there was uh, warfare with the Assyrians. The invention of the stirrup uh, happened uh, about then. Uh, uh, carriages uh, were invented about uh, 3,300 years BC. Not a lot before then. Uh, and in addition, a few other things, wine, metals, tents, arrows, hose, ropes, fish hooks, canoes, uh, horse bits, saddles, uh, metal production, and stirrups. So it was, uh, now by the way, this was over 1,000 years, so it may seem like a lot, but there's still 1,000 years. Uh, so uh, it, it wasn't exactly a super fast uh, pace. At that point, by the way, it was estimated that there were 10 to 15 million people in the world. Uh, if, if you lived in a community, you probably lived in a community of something like 20 people. Uh, and the next community to you was probably 100 miles away. So you didn't invite folks over for dinner and to discuss new ideas and things of that sort. It was a very, very sparse uh, uh, population, and yet these things were invented. Um, a thousand years later, we invented entrepreneurship. I define entrepreneurship uh, as taking risk. The, the French word entreprendre means to undertake risk. Uh, so you can invent something new, but unless you try to introduce it in the market and take economic risk, you wouldn't call that entrepreneurial. You'd call it innovative, but not entrepreneurial. So the first entrepreneurial, the entrepreneurism uh, requires risk, which means that it requires making an investment of some kind, which requires money. And so money uh, hadn't really uh, been uh, categorized as a thing in, until, uh, the, uh, until 2400 uh, BC. And then we had the first bond. And as far as anybody that I know knows, this is a, the representation of the first bond and the obligations of the bondholders. Uh, and this was uh, denominated in grain units, which were the units of currency at the time, 2400 BC. Skipping forward uh, 1,500 years at this rapid fire pace that we're going, um, it was Homer, uh, uh, the, the creator. Uh, and we, we know all about Homer and Homer's writings, except that Homer doesn't appear to be Homer anymore. Homer appears to be a group. Uh, and someone was uh, writing down what uh, Homer, this, the, the individual, the mythical individual, was supposed to have uh, been saying. Uh, and uh, he, he had the Iliad and the Odysseys, which uh, even if you read them today, you will have to say, this is surprising. This is an innovative set of ideas, even uh, uh, 4,000 uh, years later. We also had, during uh, the roughly the same period of time, about 500 BC, the Muses, there were, uh, there were nine of them. Um, and they, the, the purpose of muses were to trigger associations in other people. They weren't creative themselves, but they helped other people uh, be creative. Uh, they were the daughters of uh, Zeus and Memnesine. They were common in Greek and Roman and Indian 
cultures, by the way, they had different names, but the, the concept was, was the same. Not in Chinese cultures to the best of my knowledge, by the way, which is kind of interesting. Uh, because 500 BC, China was well along, and they had, China had many uh, notable scholars with many uh, contributions, but not this one. Um, they inspired creation, songs, dance, poetry, through a simulated association. So a stimulated association. So you would try to get someone, to, if you sang a song, you'd try to get someone else to sing a song. So that, that was, the, the notion of creating something new was, was becoming popular. Um, but Parmenides, around the same time, uh, had a different idea. And he was really uh, upset about all these new things that were being uh, created. So he asserted, uh, and I'll show you the quotes in a second, that nothing really changed. You, I mean, the life, we're, 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 the way we're born and the way we die are exactly the same. Nothing fundamentally changes in life. In other words, creativity is impossible. Um, and that was the Eleatic school of uh, philosophy. He, he was uh, viewed as a realist. He told it the way of truth. Change is impossible. That was the first assertion of the Eleatic school. Uh, existence is timeless, uniform, and unchanging. So they, they hadn't uh, dealt with time. We'll, we'll talk about time uh, in, in a second. But you know, when, uh, when Parmenides went to bed, he didn't, he didn't watch uh, the late night show. I mean, th that was impossible. The only thing Parmenides could do, and he went to bed when the sun went down because there was no, no, nothing to, uh, no light around, he would look at the stars. Uh, and it turns out uh, that one group of people, mainly the Western people, tended to look more at the moon. We'll see, we'll see that uh, in, in a while. The Eastern people, the Chinese, tended to look at the stars. And so a lot of our traditions come from the moon and the faces of the moon. We'll see about that. The Chinese traditions come from, more from, from the stars than the changing of the universe. The, 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 those were the only two things up there. And then there was the way of opinion, which was the opposite of the, of, of the way of truth. And one century facilities lead to conceptions which are false and deceitful. So if you see something that's changing, you've got it wrong. You made a mistake, right? Because nothing has changed, according to Parmenides. Uh, Plato uh, actually accepted that view, uh, quite surprisingly to some. Um, uh, will we say of a painter that he makes uh, something? Plato answers, certainly not. He merely imitates. So an artist was there to imitate, not to create. Uh, and this is uh, you know, around uh, 400 uh, BC or so. And then, uh, then came Aristotle. And uh, there were, the, I think, actual innovations, as opposed to the commercialization of innovation, which had to wait for another several thousand years. Uh, there were, but there were plenty of innovations uh, in the Hellenistic uh, period. Um, and we will see them in a second. I'm pressing, but nothing's happening. Can we advance? There we go. OK. So you recognize this guy. This is Archimedes. Um, and he was uh, famous for saying Eureka. Uh, and we, of course, he said Eureka because he figured out how to determine the volume of his own body by sitting in water and seeing how much the water had displaced. And he could calculate that. So it had to be the, the same amount. And that was kind of the discovery of discovery. Uh, this wasn't commercialized. He didn't take it public. There was no, no NASDAQ or anything for him to, to capitalize on this innovation. Uh, but, it, but it did start other people thinking, I can do new things. And so you find all kinds of new things uh, starting uh, at about 500 BC. This one, uh, which is a little bit uh, later, is the Antikythera mechanism. You may have seen pictures of it. This is one complicated puppy. Uh, and it was used to calculate uh, where you were on a ship compared to the position of where the stars were whenever they were there. And uh, <clears throat> it was used to calculate the position and predict eclipses, months and days from the Sothic uh, Egyptian calendar, with leap year days included in this uh, calculating machine. And so it was, uh, this was an extraordinary, uh, extraordinary device. Um, so it wasn't that people weren't creative uh, or couldn't figure out new things uh, 2,000 years ago. They were plenty smart, uh, but they're, they started from a, a different pace that we did. Those ideas uh, kind of continued in this battle between whether you could create something or not create something. Uh, and the last one I find is Paul Goulden, who's a, uh, a, a monk uh, in, that lived around the beginning of the 17th century. And he said, the purpose of mathematics 
was to construct the world as a fixed and eternally unchanging place, which in, in which order and hierarchy could never be challenged. So this is 1700. This is not that long ago, actually, at least compared to where we started at 40, uh, 43,000 BC. So for a, for a very long period of human uh, history, we believe that nothing could, many people believe that nothing could change. Uh, then uh, around uh, uh, the 15th century, things really started to change. Uh, this, this guy, Leonardo, appeared. And he just didn't see anything the way it uh, had been before. Everything that he did uh, was uh, new. We had Michelangelo. We had Machiavelli. Uh, and I won't uh, quote uh, Machiavelli here other than uh, he is famous for saying controversial things. <clears throat> One of the things that he said was of the pope, who was the head of the Catholic Church, of course, he said, no pope should be himself conventionally religious. So he wasn't, uh, and uh, he was talking about Pope uh, Paul VI, who had uh, six wives and 14 children. So it was to give him a little bit of uh, leeway on some of the church's principles. Um, and then, of course, we had Shakespeare. Uh, we had the printing press, which was probably the most fundamental innovation uh, of all. Uh, and we had the beginning of changes in language. Uh, science is a word that uh, is first recorded in the 14th century. Create the word 14th century. Uh, innovation, 15th century. Scientific create, uh, creative, uh, the propensity to create and disrupt uh, the famous word uh, in uh, the 18th uh, uh, century. We had cabinets of curiosities. People were beginning to travel and find things, and, and they had no idea what they were, but they thought they were cool. So they, they'd bring them home, and instead of putting them in a library, they put them uh, into these cabinets of creativity and you'd, you'd, you'd curiosities, and you'd, you'd find all manner of, of things in here. They had no idea what it made, uh, what it meant, but they thought they were cool. So, so, they, they, so they did that. You can see little tiny lions uh, down here. I, I don't know where they found the little tiny lions. Um, <laughs> Then, then there were scientific uh, networks. The Royal Society was founded uh, in 1660. Uh, and the concept of, of creativity um, uh, uh, was hinted at. Uh, and there was a fellow named William Duff for whom no pictures exist, for William or his family uh, uh, or his house that I can find. Uh, and he talked about the theory of genius, which was imagination, judgment, uh, and, and taste. Uh, and there were subsequent books about it, The Pleasure of the Imagination. Uh, and you, could, you can imagine that the concept of creativity was alive here, but uh, the, the word uh, creative had not yet uh, come into uh, the dictionary. So it was more about imagination, judgment, and taste than divine inspiration. So this was a huge uh, turning point uh, in Western history. Then we come up uh, to the 19th century and... Uh, and the most amazing century I think the world has ever experienced, which was from the Battle of, of Waterloo in uh, 1850 to Sarajevo in 1914, 99 years. Uh, Bertrand Russell uh, said it was the most important century that, that we have ever seen. There was less war and more science and more creativity in that century than has ever been seen up until uh, the, the, the present day. That's when we really broke through from 1815 to 1914. Uh, um, and war then uh, returned, and there, there was certainly a lot of creativity in war. But in terms of uh, uh, utensils and things that could be used in ordinary life, psychology basically was formulated in the, the, the 19th uh, century. The notion of uh, the nervous system came out of the 19th century. On and on and on and on. We'll see some more of those uh, in, in a bit. Um, so uh, the pace uh, of war slowed another pattern. As, as the pace of war uh, emerged, another pattern began to emerge. Anybody know where this place is? You probably, you may have been there, although it may not look the same. This is Giverny. This, this is the place that was the inspiration for uh, all the Impressionist uh, paintings. Uh, and in this century, this 1815 to 1914, de Maupassant invented the short story. It didn't exist. It, it came from weekly newspapers, uh, and they wanted to keep the newspaper readers reading. So they, they stopped the story just short of where the bad guy gets killed. And that, that started the, the, in the next week. So you bought the paper the next week. Um, Verdi uh, and, and Wagner uh, were writing. Bruckner, Mahler, uh, Sibelius, and Satte were all writing wildly new forms of, of music. 
Gal uh, explained uh, where speech uh, is in the, in the brain, the first uh, really neuroscience uh, invention. Niepce created the permanent photographic image in uh, 1816, I believe, was the first one. So photography uh, started then. Darwin described evolution in uh, that, that period of time. Maxwell explained electromagnetism. Cauchy developed number theory. And Freud defined psychoanalysis. It was a hell of a century. I mean, it was absolutely unbelievable what happened uh, there. It's not that these all fed off each other, but there was a zeitgeist uh, that, that allowed all of this uh, to happen in, in Europe. Um, in, in this country, Noah Porter, who was the seventh president of Yale, had real trouble reconciling this with his fundamentally religious beliefs. Uh, and he uh, talked about the human intellect. It was a 700-pager that every Yale student had to read. I don't think I could have made it through the first 100 pages. I've tried to. I can't get by 10 pages. But, um, and he, what he couldn't do was reconcile psychology and the soul. He just, he just couldn't figure out if you had psychology and something was going on in your brain, where was your soul and where was it in your brain? Just couldn't figure that out and ended his book in, in almost a trailed off at the, at the end after 700 pages. So what is this uh, thing called creativity? And when, and by the way, did this word creativity start to appear in the dictionary? Uh, I define it as the art and science of the near possible. What's almost possible but not yet quite, and, that, and to have a sense of that. That word made it into Webster's for the first time ever in 1875. That's not that long ago. Yeah, creativity. Uh, uh, everybody says that can't be. And I said, be my guest. Go, go look it up. Uh, but you'll find that at least according to Webster's, uh, create, creative goes back to the 16th century. But creativity, something that you and I can do, is a word that, that has its origins in 1875. In, Gives you incredible insight into where you know where we've come in that 140 years or whatever it's been since 1875, um, and uh, I, this is my definition because I don't uh, I don't like definitions that say creativity is the art of creating something new. That doesn't tell me anything. So, uh, to me, creativity is to associate previously unassociated concepts. Now, maybe this is one math concept associated with another math concept. Maybe, for example, a lot of my surgeon friends are trained uh, in painting. Why? Because they can control their hands. So they associate art and medical practice. That's creative in, in my mind. Those are, those are big leaps. And that's what you guys should be trying to do. You can't do that if you're monodisciplined. You, you have to have multiple disciplines. And the further the disciplines are from one another, the better. Uh, if you can find the points of connectivity. If you can't find the connectivity, then it's not going to work. But that's, that's, what you, uh, that's, that's the value of a broad liberal education, uh, it, it seems to me. Uh, the creative act by connecting previously unrelated dimensions of, of experience enables him to, uh, uh, the creator, to uh, attain a higher level of mental uh, evolution. This is from Arthur Kessler. Um, who was one of the great writers of the 1960s. We'll see more of him uh, in a little bit. It's not an act of liberation, the defeat of habit um, uh, by originality. So it, it is the defeat of habit by uh, originality. So associating previously unassociated concepts can be a pro very productive kind of exercise, uh, and, but it, sometimes it takes a lot of tries in order to uh, produce something that, that actually uh, works. And that's just uh, a part of it here. Uh, William James, the brother of Henry James, a famous novelist, and the first uh, dean of the Department of Psychology at Harvard in the late 19th century, uh, in The Will to Believe said uh, about creativity, instead of thoughts of concrete things patiently following one another on a beaten track of habitual suggestion, we have the most abrupt cross-cuts and transitions from one idea to another, rarefied abstractions and discriminations, unheard of combinations of elements, the uh, subtlest associations uh, of analogy. We seem introduced uh, suddenly into a seething cauldron uh, of ideas where everything is fizzling and bobbling about, those are technical terms, in a state of bewildering activity where partnerships can be joined or loosened in an instant, treadmill routine is unknown, and the unexpected is the only law. That's what creativity is about. If this sounds more like a dream state than what you do during the day, it is. And by the way, if that sounds like an invitation to pay attention to what you're dreaming 
and these unexpected associations that you have when you're dreaming, please do that. And please write them down because I guarantee you, no matter how hard you promise yourself you're going to write those things down, you will never remember it in the morning, ever, right? So you have to write them down. I, I find mine come in, in triplets. I, I get three of these. They all come, and I write them, uh, write them down. Uh, then I go to sleep, and then I get another three. And sometimes I'll get a third set of three, but I ne I've never gotten a fourth set of three. And I get up, and I read them in the morning, and you know what? 90% of them are completely nonsense <laughs> and have no value whatsoever. But one is kind of interesting, and that's worth it. Uh, if you get one or two ideas that are useful a week, uh, that's highly uh, productive. It, it doesn't interfere with sleep at all, by the way. Um, at least my sleep. Uh, so to me, um, uh, creativity, uh, another, said another way, is mastering the arts of the near possible. I mean, we can, we can think about uh, hypersonic uh, well, even that's the near possible these days. Uh, but we can, we can think about uh, space travel and going to the moon in an afternoon or something, but that's not really the near possible. You want to be thinking about things that are the near possible. What is the near possible? You'll have to define it for yourself, but we all define it in our own way. Uh, in the 60s and 70s, nobody ever said, I need a laser. That, that wasn't why they weren't trying to develop a laser. It just ha happened. It came from sound, as a matter of fact. Nobody ever said, I need a drone. That may be a little less true, but, but certainly 15 years ago, nobody was, or 20 years ago, people were saying, I didn't need a drone. Nobody ever said, and I really believe this is deeply true, nobody said, I need a Leighton Dirichlet algorithm. Uh, those of you who know Leighton Dirichlet algorithms uh, may, uh, may have uh, thought that, but uh, I didn't. And they're very useful, and they're, they're, they're very cool. And in fact, nobody said, I need an iPhone. Well, one person did, but he didn't say it until uh, 20, 25 years ago. So these came from mastering the arts of the near possible. And Jobs is a perfect example of that. He, he was the master of the arts of the near possible. So if you want to be creative, start looking at the arts of the near possible. Now, there, there are surprises sometimes. Sometimes the world works the opposite way from the way you think it's, it's going to work. But uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so um, there are all kinds of surprises, which keeps it interesting. Return to uh, Bertrand Russell, who I think is perhaps the greatest mind of the last 200 uh, years. And he had a condition. The greatest challenge to any thinker is stating the problem in a way that will allow the solution. So that's not just a little detail, right? That's an absolutely essential thing. And he was one of the most articulate people, multilingual, uh, and he was just as good a mathematician as he was a history writer, which is very unusual. But he had the ability and the art to uh, state a problem in a way that will allow a solution. So it's not obvious. You can't just state a problem. You have to state it in a way that it can be solved. Vladimir Nabokov, uh, a famous author and lepidopterist, by the way, is uh, one of the world's great lepidopterists, uh, said genius is finding the invisible link between things. And that's what this is all about. Thinking, thinking, thinking. That's where the dream uh, come, come into this. You can do this during the day. And lots of innovations have come during the day. But a whole lot have come uh, during uh, night as well. Uh, Nabokov talks about phases of inspiration uh, as a preferatory glow. You have a sense that you're going to come up with something. You haven't come up with anything, but you have a sense it's going to happen. It's a tickly well-being that banishes awareness of physical discomfort, uh, uh, a forefeeling of, of what uh, is going to happen, instant vision that turns into rapid speech, and a tumble of merging words forming the nucleus of a work which will grow over months and years. If this sounds uh, like a mess uh, that's going to turn into something productive, that's exactly, that's exactly what it is. Um, various uh, uh, people have asked the question uh, over time of, why am I so productive? Why am I just so much smarter than all my colleagues? I, don't, I won't tell them that, but I really think I am. Um, and there were a couple of uh, well-known scientists who said this. Hermann von Helmholtz was, was one, the uh, physicist. And Henri Poincaré, the mathematician, was another one. They both asked the same question. And they both came up with more or less the same answer. <clears throat> and that answer was synthesized uh, by a guy by the name of Graham Wallace in 1926. Graham Wallace was a Fabian. The Fabians were a forerunner of the Liberal Party. They were the Communist Party in, in uh, Britain in the 1920s. And Wallace wrote this wonderful book called The Art of Thought. Now, uh, you, um, you can buy a copy of this now for a buck on, on Amazon. You can get the original for 5000 uh, on Amazon. There are three basic phases. He actually had five, but I'll summarize it as three. There's preparation, which is something that all of us, I hope, will be doing every day. There's incubation, 
When you're near to an idea, that's the state that an, an idea may be close. And then there's illumination, that's that flash, which happens in seconds. The first two can take weeks or months. The last one takes place in, in seconds. Um, and this, uh, no matter how many times this idea has been tested, it's always found to be uh, basically accurate. And it's a good description for what you should expect uh, in what's normal in, in uh, your life. Uh, Jung uh, also talked about uh, creativity. <clears throat> he talked about it happening in the subconscious, of course, and, and of course, it, it does. Uh, he talked about it happening in dreams, of course, it does. It talks about the value of free association, which is correct. He talks about integrating opposites for the insight that that, that brings, and that's all true. Another fellow that talked about it, and I've uh, mentioned him briefly, was Arthur, Arthur Kessler, uh, the great author, Darkness at Noon, and several other things. He was a, he was a writer, he was a Hungarian, uh, he was born as a communist, uh, rejected it at the age of 15, was almost uh, shot because of that, then went off to fight in the Spanish military, was almost killed there, came back, uh, became an English citizen, and uh, wrote wonderful, wonderful books, one of which was called The Act of Creation. Sorry that this is a little bit off the uh, list. Uh, you, can, you can get paper copies, of, I think, of The Act of Creation. It's about 600 pages long, um, and 200 pages on art, 200 pages on science, and uh, 200 uh, pages on, on personal insights. It's, it's really a wonderful, wonderful book. And he talked about bisociation. It's the association of two previously unrelated ideas, just like we've been talking about since the beginning. Um, and, and he had three f uh, 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 kind of characters that represented these things. There was the jester, the, the sage, uh, and, and the artist. And he thought, we all need to be part of each uh, in order to have a creative uh, life. Current examples, you may know Alice Aycock. Uh, Alice Aycock is a sculptress, sculptress uh, in New York. She's also fascinated by partial differential uh, uh, equations. Well, that's a little weird. We don't have a lot of artists that are in fascinated by partial differential equations. But what does, so what does she do with these not very clearly related activities? Well, she puts sculptures on Park Avenue. That's what she does. This is, this is not quite a solution to a PDE. But it is not far uh, either. It's inspired uh, by that. Here's, a, here's another one. And here's another one. I think these things are absolutely marvelous. And they are all uh, sparked by notions that uh, she's seen of PDEs. So uh, don't, uh, don't, dis uh, don't discard that calculus course that you had. Um, and Marcel Duchamp uh, said, art making is making the invisible visible. And I, I think that's a very good uh, description. So did uh, Jean Plenza, who is another sculptor here in New York, uh, making the invisible visible. You see the head? Uh, it's basically it's, it's a wireframe head. Uh, and he does this all over the place. And it's, it's quite wonderful. It, it gives you, it, it, at least it makes me wonder. It triggers wonder about neuroscience, about lots of other things uh, that you can imagine. So I, I think he's a great artist because of this. Um, and then there's uh, this fellow whose name is Santiago Calatrava. You may know him because Subway Station in Wall Street, right? He's Calatrava, the big dinosaur, the stegosaurus. This is the, the architect of that. Uh, he has a series of interests. He's interested in skeletons and bones of all kinds of different things. And every bone, he knows the architecture of every bone, uh, bone, uh, bone there is. He's interested in bugs. He really likes uh, all kinds of bugs. He likes fly wings, the architecture of fly wings. He's fascinated uh, by that. He's interested in flies' eyes. He thinks that's really, really cool. And he loves uh, uh, partial differential equations and uh, their solution. Well, that's a normal set of things for people to be interested in. And, and out of that, of course, he produces this. These are some of his buildings. Right? So this, the idea of focus, 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 that's fine. You need that for some things. You, know, you, you don't. You don't want to be a, a, a gallbladder surgeon and not understand about that, that's for sure. You don't want to be creative at that moment. Uh, but there's another part to life, and it's about this associating previously unassociated uh, concepts as well. This is his hyperbolic uh, equation. He turned it into a library. Uh, so as, as we alluded to before, creativity really starts with curiosity and these cabinets of curiosity. Don't hesitate to keep collections of really weird things because it may stimulate you at some day and at some point. You, you don't know exactly when it's good, uh, what it's going to be. Ubiquitous interests are better than, than uh, simply a narrow interest. Abstraction ability, exploring beyond the boundaries, exploring the boundaries, assumptions, implications, flaws, 
openness, uh, love for ambiguity, a certain immaturity. All these are characteristics which we should celebrate because they lead in some ways to creativity. That is, if we want to, uh, if we think creativity is a good idea, and I do. Um, so if the only way we're going to get out of the past is through creative efforts going, going forward. So these, these are some of the characteristics that help. This fellow uh, was also uh, curious about curiosity, and he said it starts with wonder. Whoever is devoid of the capacity to wonder, whoever remains unmoved, whoever cannot contemplate or know the deep shudder of the soul in enchantment might just as well be dead. Uh, and just to be sure that we understood exactly what he was saying. Uh, so I, I, you know, I think there's uh, uh, a lot in that. For he has already closed his eyes upon life. And that's what we have to, the, closing our li eyes on life is a danger that we all have. Hunches play a, an important role uh, in this. This is the after the I have a feeling stage. And this is Walter Cannon. Walter Cannon was the first uh, dean of the Department of, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, Pathology at, at Harvard. Um, and he talked about hunches uh, in the way of the investigator. And in, in his ideas, you, every, every good idea started with a hunch that it might, might be something there. So he would encourage his students to have these hunches. Uh, and then beyond hunches, you go to these associations. Instinctive framework builders are, are, are ten, tend to be quite creative. Psychologically androgynous, who can identify with, with different points of view. They're both extroverted and introverted. They don't fit very well on the typical psychological profile because they seem to have multiple profiles, which is, in fact, they do, which is, in fact, their secret sauce. Uh, they're both aggressive and, and nurturing. They're sensitive and, and rigid. They're dominant and submissive. They're conservative, uh, yet uh, risk-seeking, and they're humble and proud. Uh, they can be a real pain in the neck to be with, that's, uh, that's for sure. But, but they have these, these different kinds of uh, characteristics. And maybe the, the overarching one is they, they often have a sunny sense of pessimism, um, and, uh, which is uh, Mihaly, Chick, uh, Mihaly was, who was a psychologist at, uh, at uh, Chicago, used that phrase. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful phrase. Associations uh, uh, provide uh, clues to the near possible. Delayed commitment to hypothesis, formulation, waiting periods, manipulating data, as opposed to get it done by, by the deadline. Suspended uh, disbelief for hours or days or months, allowing selective rearrangements. Time scales. I, I, I think I, I must sound like the most anti-McKinsey McKinsey person you've ever met, but I do believe that there's a role uh, for all this. There's a role for the other as well, too, but don't, don't misunderstand. If you're only this, then you're going to have a hard time making your way in the world. But if you don't have this, you, you will have even a harder long-term and less rewarding way. Um, listen for small voices. Uh, this is a fellow who was uh, hard of hearing, and in the uh, First World War, he was used with these augmented hearing devices to listen for enemy planes coming from miles uh, miles away, and, and they were very effective. So there were hundreds of these people that were on the near the front lines in, in Europe uh, using these devices to listen to the small voices. The near, uh, the near possible is always lurking. And by the way, you don't have to walk more than 10 feet to see the near possible lurking. Lurking here is quite wonderful, what I've, I've seen. It, it will, it'll be filled with ambiguities, things that are capable of multiple interpretation, illusions, distortions of senses, Paradoxes. This sem sentence is false. What do you do with that? Is you know, is it or isn't it? I mean, um, dilemmas, double propositions, riddles and puzzles, conundrums, uh, and uh, enigmas uh, and fallacies. All these things that we typically tend to put over in the corner are sources of possible insight, and you want to understand them and question: Is it a fallacy? Is it an enigma? What what's at the root of that? And insight is often at the root of that. We also need to you know, zoom out. Uh, and this is a, a, a picture of, uh, you know, you're not going to get the view of the world that we, we now have uh, because of uh, satellites, before satellites. Uh, you also want to be uh, able to zoom in. This is Marshall McLuhan, uh, who some of you uh, may have read, Canadian uh, author and, and uh, thought, thought leader. He said, I don't know who discovered water, but it wasn't a fish. Uh, and I, th I think that's a very nice uh, statement. So, you know, you can't uh, always expect people that are fish to discover other fish. Um, and you have to zoom out to see the context uh, of, of, these, of these things. Discover unknown ontologies. Everybody know what an ontology is? 
Find out, uh, homework assignment, find out what ontologies are. They're very important, the structure of knowledge, basically. Uh, <clears throat> assembling associations. As Claude Levi-Strauss, uh, who I didn't know, and as John Seeley Brown, the first head of the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, who I did know, do know, um, and uh, they, they all talk about associations. Um, in fact, they talk about bricolage, which is assembling associations. Bricolage is found art in some ways. It's uh, paintings that have all kinds of different things in it. So this may not be a very good example because this is kind of organized bricolage, but it's nevertheless all kinds of different things. Each one of those little A's there, assume that's an association of, of one kind or another. And maybe you see a pattern in those A's and, and maybe you don't. But if you find, if you collect more associations, then maybe it starts to form a, a, a pattern. And when you get a new one, you have to figure out where that association goes. And pretty soon, uh, you can see that there is a pattern there. And then you can see connections uh, between those patterns. Now, it's not a unique connection. Uh, there can be all different kinds of connections there. But you, you have to construct those uh, networks of associations to have really have a useful idea. It's not just generally about one thing. It's one thing in the context of a bunch of other things. Uh, and so this is uh, uh, what I would call thinking really slow. Uh, the, you've, you've seen the book Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow. In, in, in Thinking Slow, what, what he's talking about is thinking uh, in the periods of minutes or hours. I'm talking about thinking months and days. Uh, of this really, really slow. Uh, and so you have to accumulate some insight along the way, but I think it's quite good. Give you a, a historic example of slow thinking. This is Florence, a few hundred years ago. Uh, and in the middle of Florence, as, as you can see, there's this big dome, and the dome is known, as is still the largest dome as far as I know, even bigger than Hagia Sophia. Um, uh, and this is Brunelleschi's dome, is so-called, because Filippo Brunelleschi designed it. Um, and uh, it, is, it sits in, still sits in the middle of, of Florence. Um, and uh, Brunelleschi said, nor can one say it is a creative person who starts the creative, uh, th uh, actually, uh, Chick Mihaly said this, nor can one say that it is a creative person who starts the creative process. In reality, they were only catalysts for a much more complex process with many participants and many inputs. So that's a, a plea for uh, humility, uh, I, I think. And in this case, in the case of, whoops, uh, I think we have uh, a, a projection problem. Oh. oh, I am. OK, I, I, I'm getting that. Oh. Fabulous, thank you. So what, what, what are the constituents of Brunelleschi's dome? Well, one is herringbone roads. Uh, and concrete to hold the bricks together, uh, which was a Roman invention from about 500 BC. Uh, there was all, also uh, the, uh, the arched dome uh, with a hole in the top. And as the, the, the dome was very heavy on the bottom and very light on the top, they had invented concrete that could be made that would solidify even at lower and lower densities. So those two ideas uh, were, were brought together. Uh, that, that came from the Pantheon in uh, 126, well before Brunelleschi. Brunelleschi combined these things in order to come up with his design for the first time, quick setting concrete for, for the largest dome uh, still uh, in, in the world. The construction of associative networks. So all these things, all your life experience goes into the construction of these, uh, of these associative networks. Other uh, not so current examples, World Wide Web uh, and plus graph theory plus digital library. What's that? Well. Let me give you more clues. All right. So this, it, it is an associative, Google is an associative network. Now there are thousands of parts to the network. But in the beginning, it was those three things. So how do you actually do it, um, if that's the case? Um, I think there's several steps. It starts with curiosity, not surprisingly. Uh, it goes on to collection and curation, just collection, lots and lots of stuff. Somebody wanted to get me to use Google Docs the other day, and I said, I'm sorry, I just have too much in my memory to use Google Docs. I can't, I can't do it anymore because it doesn't fit with the other uh, ways I'm curating. Uh, and that's a, that's a uh, never-ending uh, never process, uh, and that results in creation, which itself stimulates more curiosity, which then starts to cycle all over again. And that's, so it's a way of life that we're talking about. It's, it's hyper-cyclical. Hyper now, can I be more specific about it? I'll try to be more specific. 
First, uh, gathering data is a big, important uh, part of this whole thing. Uh, then creating lists. I'm a huge maker of lists, uh, and I'll give you an example of that at the end. I think you should be too. Lists are fa fantastic things because then you can organize the list. Don't organize and then make the list. Make the list and then organize. And they're not just little lists. Make big lists. Um, then organizing the list into categories, which is grouping them by, by similarities. Naming the categories. Naming is a hugely important art. And it's not, you can't give it the name A27.44. That, that doesn't mean anything. It has to be uh, in some language that people can uh, understand because that's the condensation of everything that's in, in all the, the list uh, below it. And then structuring the categories uh, into an ontology, as we, we talked about. And then comparing categories to determine conflicts, gaps, errors, puzzles, anomalies, and possible description. That's, the, that's as close as I can get to what, what process you should be uh, uh, going through. And of course, uh, it is hyper-cyclical uh, uh, to do it. So let me try just one more level of, of uh, specificity. There are four steps that, that are meta steps that you have to think about. One is observing. So you should be careful observers of everything in your environment. How could you have a better place than here in order to uh, uh, improve your skills of observation? If you're missing something here, and, and you have to be missing something here because there's so much here, uh, then, then you're missing uh, an opportunity. Then reflection, uh, then talking with your colleagues about it, and then putting these uh, in, into ideas. So let me get a little bit more uh, specific. Um, observation is about broad search. It's about searching the periphery. It's about looking for anomalies. It's about looking for paradoxes, analogies, and direct experience. So those are some of the components uh, of, of search. Then there's reflection. Zoom in, zoom out thinking that, that we've talked about. Suspending judgment, not reaching to, uh, rushing to judgment. Finding the mil, uh, missing elements. Restructuring the data, juxtaposing an association. And sleep, which I'll come back to in a second. Sleep is enormously uh, Im important uh, in, in all this. In fact, uh, just uh, this is the Greek word for uh, sleep. Uh, and uh, there are two types of, of uh, sleepers. There are people who are hypnagogic. Do you, you know that word? Anybody know the word hypnagogic? Those are people uh, who uh, have their ideas as they're falling asleep, uh, as the people in this audience are, uh, this audience here. You guys are quite awake, so that's good. Um, and they're, they're hypnopompic, uh, and hypnopompic are people that tend to have ideas in the middle of the night, and they have them as, as they're waking up. I'm totally hypnopompic. My wife is uh, hypnagogic. In, in fact, uh, my first wife was also hypnagogic, and that, at the technology at the time, I'd turn on my light and write down uh, the ideas and then turn the light off. I'm not married to her anymore. It was her choice. Um, and uh, the, the new one, I, I use my iPhone. It, it doesn't bother anybody, so I'm still married. So, so that's, that's good. Um, and we know quite a lot uh, about how the, the brain uh, thinks these days. I'll give you one example of some of the rec some recent experiments. Uh, subjects were given a complex uh, problem to solve, and there was, there was a linear solution that would take people about 10 minutes to figure out, and then there was an aha moment that would give them about a second to f uh, figure out uh, if, if they saw it. Uh, those people who were t uh, trained on how to do all this in the morning and given the test on doing it in the morning, about 25% of them were able to find the hidden, uh, hidden answers. Those people who were trained in the afternoon and given the test at night had a much better record, about 26% as opposed to 25%. Those people who are trained at night and given the test in the morning, 60%. It's a huge difference. So if you're wasting that time when you're sleeping, you shouldn't be because it's a huge source of, of creativity. Don't waste that. Okay, so that's reflection. Conversation, setting the agenda, framing the issues, discussing narratives, contrasting views, setting the pace, revising the narratives. These are all very important parts of meetings. You don't just have a meeting. You prepare for that meeting, and you think about what's going on uh, in that meeting. In conversations, one that we had at the National Academies about 10 years ago, uh, we, we talked about cells uh, and cell phones. We went from cells to cell phones. Well, the word is the same, but it's nothing to do with each other. But we put biologists together with electrical engineers a year later, we got fantastic ideas out, out of both of them. And one of those people uh, is uh, now one of the most uh, senior people in the National Academies. Uh, so it's, uh, it, it really works. And it's an iterative uh, process. So finally, uh, there's uh, assembly of these ideas. 
uh, building associative hierarchies, drafting alternative narratives, classifying and clarifying, naming things as we talked about before, selecting and revising the narrative. These are the steps. If you want to be more creative, these are the th steps that you're going to have to assemble, I would, I would assert. Um, it's a long path to a finished innovation. Not all innovations come finished. They, they come partially complete. But the urge to do this doesn't end when you're 28, by the way. I'm sorry to announce that to some of you, but it, it can go on uh, quite long. Ben Franklin did bifocals at 78. Verdi did Falstaff at, at 80. Uh, Michelangelo did the uh, Pauline Chapel fr frescoes at 89. That was when 89 was really an 89. Uh, um, and Frank Lloyd Wright did the uh, Guggenheim at 91. So uh, this, this idea that only it can only happen early in life, it, it can be a way of life. So you don't have to just think my time is all, almost uh, up. So uh, observe, reflect, converse, assemble, all those form the mnemonic ORCA. Uh, so these ideas just jump out at you. And if you can remember ORCA, you should have a way to remember, observe, uh, reflect, con uh, converse, and assemble. And then you should be on your way into this. Example, Bob Langer. You, he's at another university. I forget what it's called. It's northeast of here. And uh, he's, he has come up with uh, 35 companies. He's, he's started 35 companies, many of which are, are quite successful today. That's very impressive. He follows a process that's not very dissimilar from that. One of his uh, guys that was working with him that I also worked with was a guy named Bobby Niger. Um, and Bobby uh, was, he, he was a very creative guy, but he couldn't focus it at all. And so he wanted, he said, I, I know I want to start a business. I, I just don't know what it is. I've been working on it, working on it, working on it, nothing happens. And I said, all right, this was on a Tuesday or something. Bobby, on Friday, I want you to give me 100 ideas for things that you could do. Don't organize them. Just give me a list of 100. And he called me, um, and he said, to per our conversation, you asked me to send you 100 ideas by, by yesterday, indicating that he hadn't gotten me 100 ideas uh, at, at, at that time. So far, I only have 11. I'm struggling to come up uh, with uh, additional, uh, additional ones. But I said, OK, you get 24 more hours. That's it. But then no excuses. Uh, but I'm still determined to come to uh, come uh, to complete this uh, exercise. So he, he did. Uh, the next day he said, since I sent you that uh, email a few hours ago, I gained 13 new ideas. So 11 to 13 more, that's, that's pretty good. I think I'm uh, going in the right direction, so I'm going to keep at it. Attached are 103 ideas that he came up with about two hours uh, a a after that. The brainstorming began slow, but the ideas started pouring, sometimes at the rate of dozens an hour. As I was coming up with ideas, my mind already started forming an ontology without me actually physically creating one. I, as I created the mental ontology, I started thinking about how you can uh, really treat obesity, which was his big, he was obese as a child, he's no longer obese, and I realized it broke down into a few groups. Uh, as a result of these changes, I'm starting to be more cognizant of the meta trends around my creative creativity. I'm starting to log and organize my observations. The ideas are flooding in. They haven't stopped for two weeks now. So this, this is what happens in, in the creative process. It's all due to uh, ORCA. So in summary, uh, uh, creativity, in my view, is about associating previously unassociated fields. And as William James said, it is the highest order of minds. And as Mike Chick Mihaly said, creativity is a primary measure of our humanity. And I believe it is a primary measure of our humanity. Creativity is not an analysis. It's a way of living. So if you wondered what was creative about this picture, do you see it? Who's that? That's Monet. That's the painter. You can see her, and you can see her reflection, but you can't see him. You can only see the reflection of him. That's, that was a creative idea in 1820. Thank you very much. This was absolutely fantastic, you know, I'm sorry, sorry, there we go, uh, an amazing thing. I've learned I'm hypnopompic. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I actually remember, it's funny, as you were speaking, that I was working on a project when I was a PhD student on part of my thesis, and I couldn't solve it, and I had a nap one afternoon, and I woke up, and I knew exactly what to do. So there you go. Hypnopompic, that's right. very good. Uh, <laughs> It's, you know, I don't really even know where to start because especially in engineering and I can see some of the people here 
who are classical engineers, if you want, classically trained, and some who are more on the sort of uh, creative, uh, artistic side, which you and I discussed, are not mutually exclusive, and this is what you're trying to, right. uh, to transmit here. So we have plenty of time for questions. I have many, but I don't want to hog the floor. Any questions? Well, per people. perfectly don't be, clear. Don't be shy. You just don't go off shy. and do it, right? No, no problems, right? Exactly. So let me start with one. One thing that's really uh, kind of, you know, I was really curious from the very beginning that you said you found most of these concepts in the Western writings, but not anywhere in China. So why is that? Yeah, let me. Uh, well, first of all, I don't know why. Uh, or that would you require know, a five thousand year. Theory. Right. Um, there's the the, uh, and I have looked for. It's not to say there aren't creative examples in China. And when I when I talk about Asia, I'm talking about. I want to. I, I mean China. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 the Indian tradition is totally different from the Chinese tradition, and the the the, the you know the minute one talks about the American culture, mm -hmm. and they use that phrase, they're in trouble already, because there isn't one culture in America. There is lots of cultures mm -hmm. in America. There isn't one culture mm -hmm. in China. There are lots of cultures in China. I yeah. assume there's not one culture in India. There must be lots of cultures mm -hmm. in, in India, that are, and and I think that's been true throughout history. So uh, when someone says, well, it's a cultural aspect, then I'd like to know what they mean by mm -hmm. culture. And I think at that point, they can't give me a strong answer, mm -hmm. uh, except in uh, abstract mm -hmm. uh, terms. Uh, maybe the opposite question uh, is, are there any cultures which are opposed uh, to creativity? And I would mm -hmm. guess the answer to that is yes. Uh, I think they're also temporary, uh, yes. because they're outcompeted mm -hmm. by, by others. But anytime you get a, a particularly rigid, uh, call it militaristic, uh, and by the way, our military is, is wildly creative, but not because, uh, be, not because they're marching down streets, right? It's, it's quite, quite opposite, and they've learned how to master that. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the more disciplined you are, and this is your function, you turn this knob this far at 10 o'clock, and that's your job, mm -hmm. there's no room for creativity in that. There's no, no room for association of previously unassociated concepts. If you, if, you, if you have previously unassociated concepts, that means you're wasting your time someplace. So, um, and that's a bad thing. So yeah, so st structured, uh, super structured societies, I think, are anti-creative. Mm -hmm. yes. Does that address your question? Uh, yes, yes, yeah. definitely. OK. Great. OK, thank you. Yeah. When we're talking about uh, associate of ideas, it was talk about um, how we can learn from uh, different kind of disciplines to gain more insights into different kind of ideas. But how do you, uh, first question is, how do you define unassociate disciplines? And the second question is, how do you balance the time you allocate to mastering your own discipline right. and discovering the other new disciplines? which will make your work more meaningful in the same time? So I, I, uh, two very good questions. On, on how you define this, I think each of you is going to have to define it for yourself. Uh, I could give you my definition, but it, it probably I irrelevant. Uh, but I, I certainly think of, of uh, surgery and painting as different. Um, and uh, are there associations, productive associations between the two? Yeah, it turns out there's a lot. Uh, but you have to start with that. So you have to bring meaning to your, uh, to your areas. And you have to define them. And you uh, have to be able to, to develop a vocabulary that allows you to go back and forth between the two disciplines. And it, it has to be legitimate. If, if you're going to make an association between a scientific field and an artistic field, you better be a good artist in that field. Or you're not really, whether it's playing the piano or, or the violin or writing music or something, uh, you can't really talk about the links between physics and music unless you're on both sides. So I'm a huge fan of everybody being multidisciplinary. I am not a, a huge fan of academics that focus you on one thing. You are going to be a civil engineer. I, that, that's fine. You can get your degree and all. But I don't think that's going to produce a creative person. And I think create, having creative ideas is one of the most wonderful aspects of life that you can imagine. So you're going to have to define that. You're going to, just, just uh, as in multiculturalism, I don't speak any languages uh, other than uh, American, right? 
I've, I've regretted it for my whole life. I tried, I had to pass two for my PhD, and I, I did, I can still de-ice airplane wings in French, but I can't do anything in German, which is really unfortunate. Um, but that's the only thing I can do in French, by the way. Uh, so uh, that, that, that was a huge mistake I, I made early on. I should have paid a lot more attention to it. So I think really trying, don't, your, your education, when you finish university, when you finish your PhD, that's the beginning. That's not the end, right? So don't think about it as the end. Think, what, what is the next subject I'm going to master after I get my PhD or whatever degree you're, you're going after? So I would think that would be the, the first uh, part of that. Um, these are ideas that you have to make your own in, in order to uh, use them. I, I'm not sure I answered your second question. Could you remind me of your second question? Um, how do you allocate your time between mastering? Uh, yeah. Carefully. Um, the, um, you know, the, a sub-question, which, which I don't mean uh, 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 cynically at all, is how do I allocate my sleep time? I mean, I have no idea when I go to bed if I'm going to have an idea that night or not. Most nights I do, uh, and I keep my little cell phone next to my bed, and I uh, say something incoherent into them and hope I can interpret it in the morning, and mostly I can. Um, I, 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 but I have no idea whether I'm going to get no ideas or 10 ideas, and that's the range. It's not 100 uh, at, at night. Same time during the day. I mean, I'm doing one thing. Oh, I thought of that thing. And, then I, and I, I used to ignore those things, and I used to say, well, that's unproductive time. Just focus, focus, focus. And I just said I was more productive by allowing myself to have those free spots and writing them down and returning to them. Not, not changing subjects, but you know, keeping the same subject. But you know, if you get an idea from someplace else, I don't know where it's coming from, but it came from someplace. Maybe there's a bird outside. I don't know where it is. And then, then I, I write them down. And I, but, I, but I keep extensive logs uh, of that. Uh, I, I use a software uh, called Inspiration. Uh, it'll set you back $47. And it's made for kids from K through three. Um, and, uh, what, and they have all these mind mapping things. I think that's useless. But it's just a, it's an outliner, basically. Uh, so I, I just write down ideas. And I'll, at, the end of, at the end of most days, I'll have 50 or 60 things I've written down. Then I start to or, organize them, because inspiration makes it very easy to organize things. So I organize them and to see whether, did I have any good ideas today? And there's a lot of days when the answer to that is clearly not. Uh, but I still keep those lists, and I can go back to them and, and look at them. And over, over time, it's very generative. It, the more of these things that one has, the more one gets. So I, I would think of it that way. As far as how to allocate your time during the day, if you think you can say, at 2 o'clock, I'm going to be creative, good luck. I, I have no hope of that at all. So I didn't, and I didn't mean to suggest that you did. You you didn't imply that by your question at all. But if if one thinks, it's, it's not, I don't think it, I don't think it accords with the way the process actually works. Um, I want to ask, how do you cultivate, like, or how should we cultivate the ability to be creative when, like, we spend a majority of our time following rules and instructions. <laughs> yes. So was, we have one dean here. I don't know. I'm glad we don't have two. I would really be in trouble. That's okay. Uh, you, it's uh, creative disruption. Right, it's creative Exactly, yeah, exactly. Uh, I, 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 again, I think that's a similar question. I think it's an excellent question, and it's a question you're going to have to answer for yourself, right? Um, it's what... Uh, do you have downtime that you don't use for other things? Is what, what fun things would you like to do that you haven't uh, been doing? How, how can you figure out how to put them into your calendar? You have to think about these things and, and make them happen. So it, it really comes back to you. Uh, by the way, five years from now, if you're dissatisfied that you haven't been creative enough, that's your problem. You've, uh, you're, you're the one that's responsible for that. So you have to figure out how to do this. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, go for uh, discovering nuclear fusion as you know your goal for the next few weeks, but I I, I would pay attention to my dreams, and I what do I dream about, and why do I dream about it, and start reflecting on that and getting a little feedback cycle be, between your awake state and your dreaming state, and I think you'll you'll I think you'll find you have many interests that you that, then you see it and say that's crazy. I'm not really interested in that. Then you should ask yourself, well, maybe I'm. I should give it a chance, right? 
and, and go see it. You'll, you'll come up with lots of ideas that are completely useless, or, or you'll find them, uh, you'll, you'll explore them, and then find that there's nothing to them. OK, well, that's part of the game. So then, then move on, right? Eventually, you figure out which ones are, are fit for purpose for you. First of all, absolutely great presentation. Thank totally you loved much. it. I have two questions. The first one um, is uh, you talked about psychology and Jung, and there's the concept of the left brain and the right brain. And it is a lot of what you're saying, really, that you, you, you allow your both brains to bounce back and forward and to d um, dialogue with you. Yes, it, it is. I, 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 I don't believe the left brain, right brain hypothesis. I think it's roughly right. Mm -hmm. um, it's like the West Coast, East Coast, uh, you know, but but um, but it's but it's in there, and these these dialogues, and that's I do pay a lot of. I mean, I, I sound a little bit New Agey, but I, I do uh, I do pay a lot of attention to what uh, I come up with when I'm sleeping. Sometimes it's oh, I remember the name that I was looking for the telephone. I mean, a lot of it's that, right? Which is of of no cosmic importance other than this, the way I remember telephone numbers. But uh, others, every once in a while, I come up with, it, oh, that's an interesting direction. Uh, and then I get up and I do something about it. So I, it, it's all very personal. And then the second is, um, right now, each year, it's faster and faster and more technologically um, complicated. And a lot of the folks in the past, like, let's say Beethoven in the 1800s, when he wrote down his ideas while he was walking in the woods. Right. So when all we're doing is relating to technology a lot, how do you see the connection with creativity either being compromised or enhanced because everything's faster and we don't touch things. We, you know, we, we have technology that does that. Right, so I think it's a super, uh, super good question. Uh, <clears throat> and I will respond to your question, but that doesn't, shouldn't be interpreted as that I have an answer. So, <laughs> uh, the, um, I, I think the world is, of course, is becoming more complex every, every day, but that's always been true since 4500 BC, right? So, uh, to me, it's your ability to abstract from all these examples and say what's common about them, right? Uh, so there were nine muses, and, but there weren't 13, right? So they, they put them into categories and get at these higher level of categories. I did a lot of work in the pharmaceutical industry when I first entered McKinsey. Well, the pharmaceutical industry when I first entered McKinsey by today's standard was dead simple. I mean, you'd think that anybody that had gotten through the second grade could do the pharmaceutical industry then. Not today. It's, it's re really complicated. So I've stayed away from pharma because I can't figure out the ontology of pharma, right? Now, digital health, I've figured out my own ontology for digital health, and I use big databases, and I, I analyze those, and I parse those, and until I get uh, some sense of what the ontology of, of, those, of that structure is, and then I start talking to people. And let's say, well, that's the goofiest idea I've ever heard, and then I go home and I redo my ontology, until I get one that I'm comfortable with. And that's, that's how I handle the increasing complexity uh, of, of the world. And then somebody will say something interesting, to me, I, I went to a lecture the other day on the space forces. I, I have no interest in space. I've never done anything in space. All that kind of, I, don't, I don't want to go colonize the moon or even Mars or anything like that. But I found this woman uh, absolutely fantastic and uh, really triggered. So I went home and I looked at how many aerospace companies are there. Well, it was 5,300, it turns out. Well, that turns out to be a lot. I didn't know that. So now I'm kind of putting those into categories. And you know, it's, I find it interesting. So. If, if you can explore, if you have an algorithm for exploring about how you gather, parse, that, that string of six things, I think that's a pretty good place to start, actually. Not simple. Yes. Thank you. Hi, I'm Amanda. Hi, Amanda. I have a question around incentivizing risk in highly structured organizations, and how would you tell a company that it's worth it to pursue these creativity that lead to innovation initiatives? Yeah, so I would never tell a company that unless they asked me a series of questions that led me to believe that answer would be useful for them. I, um, you know, uh, so the, the, the broader, the a broad issue that you've raised is, is in, in human organizations, 
it's not only about what you create. But you have to create the capacity to do that creation. But you're already doing a lot of other stuff. So as a general proposition, parallel to creating things, you have to eliminate things. Psychologically, eliminating things is really, really hard. And people don't like to do it. And they'll tell you all the reasons you can't. The minute they start telling you all the reasons they can't, they've just told you they're not going to spend any time on creativity. That's what that means, right? Uh, and if, so if, if you look at very large corporations, General Electric is a perfect example, right? So could General Electric not innovate uh, 10 or 15 years ago when it was a huge corporation compared to its size today? No, they, 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 had, they, could innovate. they had lots of innovations. It's that they couldn't bring them to scale because they couldn't get rid of their train division or their, you know, all, these, all these other things that were making products that were decades, uh, decades old. They just couldn't figure out how to get rid of them. DuPont is no longer a chemical company because it couldn't figure out, not because it couldn't innovate along the way, it did. It's you couldn't eliminate. So if you're, if you're going to play this creation game, you also have to play the elimination game uh, unless you're just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and that, that, that doesn't work, right? So a company that, that played the creation game very well was called Danaher. Uh, how many of you have heard of Danaher? That's the typical answer I get, Danaher. So 15 years ago, Danaher was, it was a little company, I don't know, $500 million, billion, something like that. Now it's about $80 billion. And the interesting thing about, an interesting thing about Danaher uh, and they completely changed their stripes. They started out an automation company and other healthcare companies. It totally changed. The chairman of Danaher, the guy that built that, is now chairman of General Electric. So the GE board, which had totally failed in, in my view, reached out and found the one guy that figured out how to innovate and eliminate at the same time without losing profitability and all that kind of stuff and brought him in, put him on the board. Three months later, they made him board chairman. That's pretty fast, right? Because they recognize the problem. You look at a, a lot of Walmart. Walmart was beat by, what's the name? Was it Amazon something? Amazon, yes, that's right. Are you kidding me? I mean, Amazon was a bookseller, and they, and they were audacious enough to take on Walmart? I mean, what are they thinking? It's the biggest food company in the world, you know, all this stuff. Toast, right? So this is, <laughs> this is the way it actually happens. And the key is the elimination. It, all the stuff we talked about at innovation, very hard. Elimination is even harder. Psychologically, very hard. So you're gonna, if you're going to do one, you're going to have to do the other, unless you're starting from zero, which none of you guys are. So, right. Any other questions? Okay. Well, let's take a moment to thank you and, and give you. A thank, you thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you all. Wow. Oh, that's great.